Welcome to Smart Women Talk. This is your host, Katana Abbott. I'm a midlife millionaire coach and a certified financial planner, and I search the world for smart women and a few good men, including best-selling authors and thought leaders who are on that leading edge. So join us for conversations on money, business, health, and inspiration, so you can live with more purpose, passion, and prosperity. Welcome to Smart Women Talk. This is your host, Katiana Abbott, and I am so excited that we are here today for International Women's Day. In fact, um, we're going to be celebrating International Women's Day all month here at Smart Women's Empowerment. So... I'm always excited about my guests, but I'm really (laughs) excited today because um, I have known um, this woman for over a decade. Um, I love the organization that she is with, and um, I've been personally touched by what we're going to talk about myself, and so I'm a huge advocate. So to um, my special guest is someone that I've known, again, for over a decade. Her name is um, Bobette Schrant. And she is a woman's advocate. She is the president and CEO of La Casa Center here in Michigan. Um, She's actually um, in Howell, Michigan, her organization is. And today we're going to be talking about standing up powerfully in the world, because this message goes to everyone. And we're going to talk specifically about how women can escape domestic violence and actually thrive organizations at the forefront of victim advocacy, like La Casa, and the importance of empowering um, victims and survivors. So I know what it's like to be a victim of domestic violence and abuse because I was a survivor myself, and so was my mother. And I think um, Babette is going to share some stats with us, um, but I believe it's one in three women that have been touched by this. So it's huge. This is such an important issue. So in fact, I taught financial literacy at La Casa several times, and the women told me that they were so inspired because of my personal story. And they said um, that what inspired them was if I could do it, they could do it. And they knew that. And, and they did. They, they thrived. It was so exciting to be part of that. So let me tell you a little bit um, about Bobette. Bobette Tran has served as the president and CEO of La Casa Center since 2008. Um, La Casa, which is based in Livingston County, Michigan, provides critical services for victims and survivors of child abuse, domestic violence, and sexual assault. Under Bobette's leadership, this independent nonprofit organization has grown in breadth and scope to provide more than 30 programs and services that help victims recover from trauma and rebuild their lives. Throughout her four decade career, Bobette has served in numerous leadership positions at nonprofit agencies in Southeast Michigan, all with a focus on empowering women children and families. She earned her master's degree in social work from Wayne State University and her bachelor degree from Michigan State University. So welcome, Bobette. I'm so excited you are here. We've been talking about this for the longest time and we are finally doing it. Yes, yes. Thank you, Katana. I am so honored to be here and to have time to spend with such a wonderful special friend as yourself in your program and sharing the information. So thank you so much for inviting me. And I've been looking forward to this. Yes, you know, I have been looking forward to this as well. And even though I've known you all this time and we have, you know, a long history together, I don't really know your story of how you got involved in this project. And I'd love for you to share it because I find that we all come here with a purpose And um, somehow our career, a lot of times our career path will be something we didn't go after, but it's something that we fall into. Yes, very much so. Uh, Interesting enough, back when I was getting my master's degree at Wayne State University, at that time we had to do a thesis. And I was particularly interested and it was called back then battered women. I was interested in this area And when I began my thesis, and this was just again in the 70s, late 70s, early 80s actually, 
there were so few services for victims of domestic violence. I was stunned as I was trying to do my paper on um, domestic violence. So that really sparked my interest in looking at abuse. So my course of my career has taken me through working in the child welfare, child abuse, sexual assault, and domestic violence, and family issues. That has always been my um, background, my drive, my interest, my passion. And when the opportunity came up at La Casa and the position for, at that time for the president CEO, I was drawn to it because, again, I was viewing this, and I was so excited when I was called for the interview that it was a full cycle of my career going from doing my thesis on domestic violence to now being directly connected to an organization that focuses on domestic violence and child abuse and sexual assault. So it was an organization that touched every aspect of what my passion and my commitment um, to, I think, a community and to the larger whole. Um, I was raised in a home and I think I was very fortunate where um, my mother was at the time. She was educated, she had a job. And back at that time, it was really pretty innovative for her to go to college and achieve. And I really felt like I had an excellent role model in my mother and in my family life and I, sharing that experience, knowing that not everyone has that um, became a real drive for me is that in our society to have um, equality and to look at equity um, really drove me. And so La Casa fell into my lap as an opportunity when I saw the application, or I mean the job posting, I quickly applied and it, it really has been, I really view it, Katana, as this is the culmination of all of my career. And this is where I will stay and retire from here. You know, yeah. the board sort of laughs sometimes that uh, I may not retire. I may die at my desk. <laughs> so, um, and that's fine with me because this is my <laughs> dream job. And I truly love what we've been able to do here at La Casa. You know, it's so interesting that you're saying that because I feel the same way. You know, I retired from my formal corporate financial planning career at 47 and I knew I wanted to do something to empower women. I went out and I got the URL for smart women's coaching and, you know, started doing events. And then um, I created the nonprofit Smart Women's Empowerment. And we got our, our donor, which um, she sponsored us. And then we had a real program. Right. And um, it was so exciting. Um, but now I, it's so funny because I've been doing this for 15 years and now Bobette, I'm 63. So I'm in that phase that is your third act. That's, you know, it's when you're to the point where you can retire, but you don't want to, you want right. to do something. So it's so exciting to be, and I know that's where you are too. You know, you're, we're at that point. It's our, it's um, that third act. And it's where we're really in a passion project. Now you're lucky enough that you're doing something that you're passionate about. So you can actually stay in it. There's a lot of women who are looking to transition to something. So we're just very lucky to be yes. at this point <laughs> that we can um, continue doing what we love. Correct. Yes, very much so. So how many years have you been there? 13. Yeah. Wow. And it's amazing how many projects and programs that you manage. I've always said that. But what I, I want to go to this, um, to talk about this idea of abuse, because um, if you can share, I, am I correct when I said one out of three women, and I'd like you to, you know, has been touched by abuse in some form. And then when we say abuse, um, I kind of mentioned it when I read your bio, but really, what is that? What, what, what are we talking about? Yes. Um, it's really any form of interpersonal abuse. And yes, one in three women, um, and actually then one in six men would be touched by this as well. The women that, it, when we're looking at abuse, it's domestic violence, sexual assault, and child abuse. Because again, those individuals that have um, encountered child abuse as they're growing up also suffer from other abuses. They um, progress in their years. So we are talking about interpersonal abuse, which can be, and when we're talking about domestic violence, Katana, there are three really major areas 
that the perpetrators of the violence utilize, and we're talking about control. It is not about anger. It is not when they say anger management, that is not, it's not about substance abuse. It is about control of another individual. And so what we have found that we're looking at financial, finances are used as a form of abuse. We talk about sexual abuse that can happen within, again, intimate partner relationships. And then also the child abuse that happens and goes on. So the control is used. There'll be threats made to the victim by the perpetrator regarding you'll never see your children again or I'll harm or hurt the children. Pets, I know there's a great deal, um, and we'll talk about that in a little bit, is the utilization of pets. You'll never see your pet again. I'll harm your pet if you should leave. Finances. Again, you will have nothing if you should leave me. So it's about control over an individual um, in the abuse situation. Yeah, and you know, you know my story. Yes. And, you know, I, I shared, in, in fact, the, the prior show just before last week um, that I did, I did a show all by myself and I did tell my story. And part of that, I told the story about when my, my stepfather was very abusive and, um, there was a point where, you know, he just, I, you know, he, he knew he, I was getting old enough. He, he was scared of me and, um, he came at me and I told on the show how, um, I jumped up on my bed and, and I, um, kicked him away and then I ripped off his pocket and I broke his horn rim glasses, <laughs> you know, and it, it was just, it was so empowering. And at that point, he told my mom, you know, she's yours, you know, I'm, you know, um, I'm not going to deal with her anymore. Um, and I was just so thrilled. And then I felt empowered and I did feel independent. And he was just coming to hit me or something because I had learned to stand up to him because I knew what he was. And, um, you know, not everybody is going to be that strong. And so I was lucky I got out of, I got out of it. And that's why I'm doing the work I'm doing. But, you know, when, when this is going on in your household, I mean, what is the first thing that um, women can do, you know, for the, if they're worried about themselves or their children, because I will tell you when um, my mom was going through this and then later I went, believe it or not, I um, went through it a second time with the very quick um, bad marriage with an abusive person again, because we go back to the familiar, you know, and I trusted, I trusted that person. But um, back, you know, for me or for my mother, there, there were really um, no, there was no help. There was no help. We didn't know what to do. Right. And I could say that over the past few decades, there's been a lot of growth um, and development in the area of domestic violence in particular. And here in the state of Michigan, again, I'm very proud of, the, of what the work Michigan has done in domestic violence. And every area, every county does have services and including our tribal um, groups have uh, services that are available. If anything, there's at least a contact number for a helpline or a crisis line that can be contacted. The one thing I'd like to share, Katana, is that with domestic violence, many times, and you may have encountered this in with your mom and your experience, is that the violence starts at a certain level and then it, it basically ratches up. It gets more difficult. So like again the frog, you know, if you put a frog in boil it, it, a frog in water and you bring the water to a boil, the frog does not jump out. If you put a frog in boiling water immediately, it jumps right out. So what really happens frequently in domestic violence is that slow buildup of abuse to then it becomes a critical point. So at any time that someone is feeling the need to speak to someone, to run questions by someone, to please reach out, reach out to your local area helpline, crisis line for domestic violence um, or sexual assault to discuss what's occurring in your home and what's happening in your family. They can advise and give you ideas of what they see, what they hear, and again, empower. So the woman has a choice. We would give them um, 
resources, availability, and let them know, particularly at La Casa, we do have a shelter that they can come to our shelter. So, and I'd also, what happens, and you mentioned this, Katana, people are embarrassed. You know, mm -hmm. again, many times we've had three women in our shelter that all have master's degrees. So it doesn't know so, social economic levels or educational levels, and they're embarrassed. Yeah. They feel bad. How could I let this happen? I've been married 10 years and I've let this occur. How can I, you know, acknowledge that is a very difficult thing for women to do. So the private helplines are a beginning stage and it's a really wonderful step to reach out for individuals that we're all specially trained. We all know how to address and work with and assist those victims. So I would suggest calling and reaching out. If you are a family member and you suspect, we work with family members and friends of victims. So we'll have people call us. We'll have a mother call us and say, I'm afraid that my daughter is in a dating violent situation. What might I be able to do to help my daughter? So we're there to help anyone who reaches out to us and provide those resources. Now, when someone does that, because again, that's the biggest thing, fear, fear, fear. So um, is it going to be kept confidential? Oh, yes. The number one area in our work that we deal is confidentiality. And so we, everything we do is confidential. We would never confirm or deny that someone is in our shelter or someone seeking services. It's extremely confidential because, Katana, we also know that it could be life or death, truly yeah, life or absolutely. death situation. So everything is kept very confidential. Um, we even have a text line. That they can text confidentially. So we make sure that there's ways that people can reach us, but it is confidential, yes. Well, I'll share with you, um, you know, I mentioned the short <laughs> marriage I had, but, and I want to share this because so often we go back to the familiar. Yes. Most and, you know, and what I teach is what happens is going on. We all have these disempowering beliefs and they show up in every area of our life. And what's going on with your money is going on with your life, all this stuff. So um, right, you know, after <laughs> my mom was you know, just getting, she, so when my mother, so this financial abuse, by the time my mother finally divorced Mel, his name was Mel, um, she was homeless and she had breast cancer. Mm -hmm. And before they were married, um, she had paid cash for a house that she used my father's death benefits from when he passed, when he drowned. And um, she got the life insurance and paid cash for a house. So this, and so he took all the money we had, even out of our kids' accounts. It was awful. And he, he got really crazy at the end. Um, it was awful. So you would think that I would have learned you know, and I moved out soon as I turned 18 and I had um, vet veterans and social security because I was a war orphan. And, but, you know, I ended up in a really bad marriage with someone who wanted his green card. I did not know. I, you know, thought he loved me, but in my heart, I knew he was bad, but I thought I could change him. I mean, <laughs> I'm sure you heard these stories yeah. before, but in nine months, you know, I knew. And, and I, um, long story, but I ended up filing for a divorce because he, he actually hit me when I, um, he came to my house and he hit me, put me in the hospital. And so I didn't do anything. The police had criminal charges against him and they called me to come to court about those. And they also had the immigration there. And he, he, he jumped in my car and told me that if I didn't drop the charges, he would track me down and kill me. And I believed him. So it's a blur, Bobette. I don't remember anything about that day. I don't remember walking into court, but I believe I just dropped the charges because I was so afraid. And, and he was crazy. He did stalk me afterwards. Um, but, you know, I ended up, you know, having a wonderful life and meeting a fabulous husband. <laughs> We've been married, you know, for almost 40 years. But, you know, at that point, somehow I know what happened. I found the book Think and Grow Rich by Napoleon Hill. And I was able to pull myself out just through the words of a book, believe it or not. And, and I was able to, um, you know, find my inner strength. But I'll tell you what, that was the scariest time in the world. 
and not knowing what to do. So having an organization to go to or a hotline, I mean, in, in, if someone were in my situation, could they have gone and gotten help and then known how to proceed going to court and not be afraid and have like an advocate even there to support me? Because my mom was in the hospital with breast cancer. You know, she couldn't come help me. Yes, most definitely. Um, what our programs provide is not only shelter, but also the advocacy. And one of the things that has changed over the years, Katana, is is in your situation, it used to be, our laws have changed. It used to be that the woman would have to file charges. So it would be the woman against the perpetrator or the husband, the male. It now is the state. So if the police are called out to a home, it's no longer the woman that's filing any charges, it is the state. And so if there's an arrest, it is the state, not the woman. So a woman couldn't drop charges. It's, again, it's crime. And so it is a legal crime. So they then are facing the state, not the woman for the charges. So that's a major change in domestic violence, which really has assisted women from, again, the situation that you experienced where he threatened your life. He still yeah. threatened their lives about the charges, but that's no longer your, a woman's decision. It's the state that would make the decision about whether they're prosecuting and moving forward or not. And so when you call La Casa, we provide, like you mentioned earlier on, we have over 30 programs. So everyone that comes in, what makes, I think, our program really unique, Katana, is that under one roof, we provide these 30 different types of programs and services. So it's really a wraparound service um, for any victim that comes to our door. So when they enter in, we provide legal advocacy um, and judicial uh, advocacy. So everyone would have an advocate, a legal advocate. We're not lawyers, but we are legal advocates, which means we go to court. We are able to help her understand what the court proceedings are going to be, what, we, what she can expect when she's in court. We work with Legal Aid of Michigan. Legal Aid comes to our agency on a regular basis. We have set appointments. So women meet with lawyers and attorneys here at our agency to be able to connect going into court. And so we really provide that legal advocacy. In addition, you know, as you said, we also provide financial understanding and literacy so that women, because so many women, we talked about finances, once they leave the situation, women become automatically, they're in poverty. They have nothing. So when they enter our system of our shelter, we're helping them with their budgeting, um, resources, um, job search, uh, apartment living, because, you know, one of the most critical times in um, an abusive situation is, and the most lethal time for a woman is when she says, I'm leaving. So we take it very seriously if she's making that move. So we're making sure that we surround her also with safety planning so that she has a plan in place to protect herself and to protect her children. We also provide parenting classes right here should she need parenting classes. All the counseling, all the therapy, both individually and group therapy, we also provide here um, right at the organization. We have transitional supportive housing. So when, if they should want to leave and make that decision, those apartments throughout our community are kept secret and quiet so people don't know where they are. And during a two year period, we are helping her to, um, empowering her to rebuild her lives. Like you mentioned how you rebuilt yours and you felt that empowerment to be able to mm -hmm. um, pick yourself up. So that's what we're, we're working with the women. We're not here to tell them what to do or how to do it. We're here to support them, look at all the possible resources that are available to them, to looking at rebuilding of their lives. So we will help them. Um, you know, for example, we, I, I wanted to say, so just the sure. fact that you help them get this apartment and it's kept secret and private to them to provide safety, because isn't that one of the most important things is to have a safe place to call home for you and your children? Yes, that's a basic need, a basic need, with, along with food and shelter yeah. and safety. And I'm not sure we always look at safety as an issue. Um, but it is, it is a, a basic need to yeah. feel safe and to feel secure. 
And that transitional supportive housing is one that that program I think is, and I believe the women that you work with here were from our transitional supportive housing program um, to feel that uh, again, that they can do it and they can do it on their own. You know, I was doing, I call what I say my walkabouts and I walk around, you know, the agency and I go in the shelter and I meet and speak with um, the different women that are in our shelter and the children that are in our shelter. And one woman had shared, and, and when I first met her, Katana, in our shelter, you know, she couldn't have eye contact. She felt, you could just feel it from her, hopelessness, um, that there was no way out. Where am I going? What am I going to do? And when I saw her, you know, a few, uh, uh, actually a few weeks, a month later, I saw her differently. She looked at me, eye contact. She said, I'm doing something I never thought I would ever be able to do. I'm getting an apartment and it's on my own for my children. I'm able to do this. And just to see, and I got a job interview and I'm going to get a job. And her whole outlook on life had really altered and changed. And that's what really keeps me going is- And, and so just so people listening or watching know, so besides the transitional housing, we're talking about, cause I, you know, I know your place so well, but um, you have a shelter too. Yes. It's temporary. Yes. And this woman was in the temporary housing, right? Yes, she was within our shelter. Okay. Mm -hmm. oh, right. So wonderful. It is, it, it is. And I've seen the amazing kitchen and all the, you know, it's like a commercial kitchen you've got for these ladies. Yes, and you know, they it's their home. While they're here at La Casa, um, I'm very respectful of the fact this is their home, this is their environment, and we want it to be um, very welcoming. And one of the things that has also changed over the years, Katana, is you know, I'm frequently asked, how long can someone stay within our shelter? And there are no deadlines any longer. There mm -hmm. used to be time frames. There isn't. It's based on each individual woman, and it's what she needs and we can focus on her needs to achieving her success. So some may be here 21 days, some may be here three months, mm -hmm. but again, we're working with her on her goals in achieving success. And so that she can become a survivor and a thriver. And a thriver, yeah, I love that. Yes, and, and you know, Katina, one of the things that I think, again, make, looking at how La Casa is so unique, by having many of the services under one roof, it also reduces the barriers and the trauma for the women and the children and the families that come to us. And the other thing it does is when we're talking about finance, is it makes good economic sense for the community rather than paying for several different services out in the community under different roofs, it's all within one. So it's good economic sense to have it all in within one organization that's expertise. And I'm very proud of the fact that Livingston County, we don't have competition amongst the agencies. La Casa is the expert and that is what we do and what we do best. So we're able to provide all those services under one roof. And if the uh, organization is listening and they wanna reach out to you, they're welcome to? Yes, most definitely. Any woman can reach out to me wherever they live, I can help or any of my staff can help with the resources in their local area that we can connect them to um, a service area. We have had women, we've had women who come here from Tennessee to our shelter. Um, I've gotten calls from New York and California and others. Um, people find us on the website and so on, but we're able to reach out and help to you know, direct them to areas of where they could get assistance um, in their area, as well as they can come here. We service, yes, primarily Livingston County, but we also serve surrounding areas. Um, we don't turn anyone away um, who needs well, services. That is absolutely wonderful. And, and I'm thinking also about just other organizations that, that are listening and um, want to learn from you. I mean, you know, I tear up when I talk about this, but just when you walk in, you have that room with the mirror, the two-way two -way mirror. And when you said that when a child is abused, they tell their story one time. And anyone who needs to hear that story can be present, you know, outside the room, the child's with a safe person explaining what happened to them. And they can take all their notes and get all the information they need, but that child is, is protected that way. 
I think that's just wonderful. Yes, that's our forensic interviewing. We mm -hmm. are, and we're very proud, Katana. I don't know if you're aware of this. Just recently, okay. we've been nationally certified as a child advocacy center. And so that is a great, it's national standards that we had to meet to be a nationally certified CAC. And that child advocacy center provides the forensic interviewing for children who um, suffer abuse so that they're only telling their story once. Um, so they're not re-traumatized over and over by telling their story. And all the professionals are on one side of the mirror. It also, the substantiation of child abuse has increased because when a child tells their story repeatedly, it can change. And then which story would a judge believe? It's very difficult. So with a child telling their story once, it's less traumatizing. And it's also assisted in the um, substantiation of child abuse cases. So the success rate is much higher um, in those cases. And it's an evidence-based model. So everything we do is evidence-based model, Katana, which means it's proven by research to be effective. And that's true for all the models of therapy that we utilize, as well as any of the programs such as parenting, forensic interviewing, our CASA program. They're all certified programs um, within our agency to provide. And I noticed that, um, you know, you, you walk up now, and I know you're getting a new building or... I, I, you know, I haven't been to your place for a couple of years. So I don't know if you got a new building already, or, but I know there was talk. But when I was there, it was a small building and you go in and it's like it goes on and on and <laughs> on. <laughs> and um, you have all these different, um, you know, rooms with teachers and, um, you know, breakout centers. And, you know, it just it's, you know, what do you do? What's happening back there? Um, yeah, so we're all under, like I said, one roof. So we have all our legal advocacy. We have a legal advocacy center. So all of our advocates that are working with any individuals, we have a counseling center. So it's a clinical center. We have our children's center and our children's center has an activities room as well as two group rooms to do group sessions with the children. Um, we know that sometimes children, um, respond better if they're not in an office, you know, by doing, uh, we have journaling, other things, and we have an activity center where the children can go with their therapist um, for their sessions. We have a, adult group rooms and that we do, again, for sexual assault and domestic violence and child abuse, we have group sessions, and those are really meant to be very supportive of um, victims. And then we have our helpline, which never closes 24 seven. And then from the helpline is our shelter that where we house actual victims of sexual assault um, and domestic violence and child abuse cases that can come into our shelter mm. and stay with our shelter. And you know, during COVID, you know, when we had restrictions, and I do wanna just mention this because COVID has been you know, so much a part of our lives the last couple of years, is the stay home, stay safe, mandate that happened, oh, yeah. that was not true for the population we serve. Staying home was not staying safe. For many, it was, again, a very difficult period. So it's like, for example, when I did my walkabout and I went to the helpline, I asked my team, you know, how are you doing, you know, here? Because we never closed during COVID at all because we're considered an essential service, mm -hmm. you know, for domestic violence. And my helpline advocate had just gotten off the phone and you could see she was really distraught. And she said, Babette, I was just talking to a woman in her closet, terrified, and she was talking very softly and I could hear the perpetrator coming, the husband coming and yelling and screaming. And then the phone went dead. And mm -hmm. so the staff was left holding like, oh my gosh, is she going to call back? Is she going to be okay? But then immediately another call came in. So, you know, she had to move to that call. So we know that during COVID, it was a difficult time. So one of the things, again, I think that made us very unique, we did not turn anyone away, Katana. So what we did was we actually housed many victims in hotels wow. because our shelter was full and we had to have some social distancing. So we housed individuals in um in hotels. 
And, you know, that's an expense we didn't, you know, plan on, obviously, right? But we never wanted someone who was in a dangerous situation not to have sheltering. So we went the extra mile to make sure that we could provide that service. And, you know, we even had a mother of five children we needed to put in a hotel to protect her and the children until we could have them come into our shelter when we had a space available. And we're still to this day currently housing in hotels. Wow. Wow, that's amazing. So what I want to say to that, if anyone is um, listening, the people who are listening or watching, um, we're going to give you the website. And if you want to learn more about La Casa and um, you are a nonprofit, you can, they can make a donation to help further this work. Because when I hear something like this, this is just amazing going above and beyond um, to make sure people are, are safe, that families, women, and children are safe and taken care of during a time like that, when where, where would they go? What would they do? Yes, exactly. And, you know, there's uh, another is that if they have a pet, Katana, I want yes. them to know, we were one of seven in the nation that developed a pet shelter right within our shelter. And we're, we were the only one in the state of Michigan until recently where we've assisted other shelters to open up to be able to take pets in. So if any woman out there, if you have a pet and you're fearful for leaving, you can bring your pet to La Casa and the pet can be right within their rooms. We converted some bedrooms so that the pet can actually be right in the room with um, the victim and the family. So we know how important pets are um, for our victims. And so we've Again, and we also have our, we're one of the only, we are the only one in the state of Michigan, we have our own advocacy dog. So when you talk about our legal advocacy and going to court, Katana, and how terrified you were in court, that is a reality. And so we actually purchased and we, well, we didn't actually, we had a donor who purchased a dog, Penny, and she's our legal advocate. She's probably the most popular and well-liked staff member at La Casa. It's <laughs> <laughs> a black lab. <laughs> and she goes to court and she was trained. We had a donor purchase her from Leaders um, School for the Blind and she goes to court and the impact that she has in court, like what you were speaking about, uh, if I could share the little story, a seven-year-old boy that was in court having to testify. If any of us have been in court, like you said, you're sitting in that big box, there's a judge with a robe on and you're looking out at the perpetrators of that abuse that are sitting in the courtroom. And you're seven years old. You can barely see over that witness box that you're testifying in. And he broke down. He could not share. He just was crying. And Penny, he had met Penny at that interview you were speaking about because Penny will go into interviews with children. So he knew Penny and Penny was in court. And so that day, they stopped the proceedings, asked if Penny could join him on the witness stand during his testimony. And of course, everyone agreed because she is allowed in court. And she went up on the stand with him, Katana, and he proceeded to pet Penny. And while he did that, he told the entire story of the horrific abuse that he suffered. Oh. And, when, and when he was done, he got off the stand and he had the biggest smile and he got down and he said to, to the, our team of staff, did you see that? Did you see that? And the staff were like, yes, you did a great job. Goes, no, no, no. I'm talking about Penny. Penny was so darn nervous. I had to calm her down. Oh. <laughs> and, and that's exactly what we want to have happen. Oh, Trans that's such a you know, all that anxiety onto Penny. And, and we had the same thing happen with an adult survivor um, of sexual assault. And little did we know, but when she was there, she was saying, no, I'm actually a vet technician. So having Penny there was unbelievable for me. So this is another thing. That the had, um, if I'm willing to share a lot of the things that we've learned and grown as an organization, because I never believe we're all the way there, Katana. There's always something that we should be looking at, seeing what we can do to improve and empower people's lives. And Penny uh, being the advocacy dog for us has been a wonderful addition 
um, to our organization as well. So that is such a beautiful story. Thank you. It yeah. really is. I mean, it just warms my heart that that a dog can have that much power to help calm a little boy down during yes. a time like that, because we, we can just imagine what that would feel like. Right. And, and if he wasn't able to testify, it would have been a mistrial. You would have had to come back. Yeah. And, and it really would have been a long and drawn out and very traumatic. Right. Young, you know, young man. So, um, yeah. So we're, I'm very proud of the team we have that we're always looking at. And, you know, another thing that's really important, Katana, that I think on a national level and within Michigan too, but here locally, we have developed domestic violence, sexual assault, and child abuse protocol. And those protocols have been developed. We've taken the lead as an organization with our community response team, but we have developed protocols so that wherever you are in Livingston County, the police will respond the same way, no matter where you are for sexual assault, domestic violence, or child abuse. So there are protocols that we also work with the law enforcement, the prosecutor's office, and local other organizations to make sure that our community is safe um, for individuals and that there's a process that people will follow um, in those cases. So can, can we give out your number in your website for yes. our listeners? Most definitely. Anyone can call. I'll be happy to share and talk with anyone. Our website is actually La Casa Center. Dot org and that's l a c a s a c e n t e r dot org and our phone number our twenty four seven helpline phone number is eight six six five two 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 seven two five and our main phone number to the office which is usually again eight thirty to five o'clock is five one seven 517 Oh gosh, now I'm I'm stuck or lost here. You know, I give out that number so many times. Um 548-1350. Okay, so we'll have we're we're gonna have Lynn make an edit. Yes, it's five. So, okay, so I can redo that one. It's 517-548-1350. Perfect, perfect. No, I appreciate that. So we have people listening from all over the world. Uh -huh. um, what tip can you give them if they know something is happening and that is not right and, and they need help um, and they're not here in Livingston County, what do you suggest that they do? Yes, again, one thing is always believe a victim. If someone is sharing a story, please believe them. Um, it is very rare that it is not actually happening and occurring. So when you're aware of something happening, listening, hearing, and believing the individual. And anyone, again, in all, in most countries, um, I would have to say most, there are hotlines. Again, they may not have all the services that we have or a shelter, but a helpline. Um, a community mental health or mental health services that you could call to say that you know abuse is happening um, and ask for what services are available in that area. And they should be able to direct them into uh, receiving some support or services. And the other is look for those hints, Katana, because again, like I shared, many times it's very slowly built up to um, the real severe abuse, it slowly increases. It may start as verbal abuse, then move into physical abuse. So if you do see bruises or you see marks or you see a change, isolation. So that's one of the major areas too, is perpetrators isolate their victims. So mm -hmm. they're limited and to contact. So knowing that there's a way that they can get a hold of someone via a phone, a contact um, through a hotline would be the, mo the first step, probably. Mm -hmm. And um, and then also, I want to ask you this. So for for women that, you know, women in the community, women who are listening, uh, do you have some tips for what they can do to, to stay in more independent and have more control over their life if something like this is happening to them? Um, to stay with 
in the environment they're in. Yeah, let's say, yeah, so they're noticing now that they're, that this person is um, starting to, you know, like telling them they have to have permission to go out with their friend, their girlfriend for a walk. <laughs> I mean, right. someone just told me that she goes, my friend has to ask permission to walk with me to go, you know, for a run or a walk. Damn. I mean, if you start seeing this happen, um, you know, that's a red flag. What do you suggest they do at that point? Because nothing's happened and people are, you know, I mean, there's not much you can do. What can that person do so that they can put themselves in a stronger position and, and be able to move, do what they need to, to, to become independent and more safe. That's what I'm asking. Yes. As the, as the example you gave is a very good one. Going back to one of the things I first said, that the abuse is about control. Yes. And so controlling another being. So your friend seeing that this person's being controlled. The, the, again, I would strongly suggest because it, since it is control, when the perpetrator loses that control, that is when the woman is most vulnerable. And that is the most lethal time for a woman when the perpetrator loses control. So that's why we take it very seriously and cautiously when a woman says that she's ready to leave. You know that statement of why doesn't she just leave? Well, if she does just leave, it could mean her life. It could be life or death. So one way through support is listening to her, asking questions, um, finding out more about what is going on and, and guidance, making suggestions about calling, talking to someone. Um, I, that is a first, is we are trained not to tell a person what to do, but how to empower them to make decisions. So every person's situation is a little different, Katana. Now we've had women that have said, I have a five-year plan to leave my perpetrator. And this is what I'm gonna do in those five years. So then they work with us through counseling in a plan. And then in five years, she did leave. She left that situation. So we listen to them about what is safe and doing a safety plan. So a woman that might come, that's why it's important. I really do strongly suggest getting professional help because that can help guide her and what is the most effective for her. You know, friends or family could just say, just leave. That is well, and it's easier to leave if you're single, but yes. if you have children, that's very difficult. Yes, it is. It is a very difficult thing to do. So by meeting with professionals, and again, it's very confidential. So we meet, we're here 24 seven. So, and we also provide, and I think this is very important is that we do walk-ins. So we have had women who are going to the grocery store who might stop in here because she has an opportunity because he you knows she's going to the grocery store. So she'll stop in here and do a walk-in session. She may only have 15 minutes because, she, you know, and I know it's hard for people to believe, she may only have 15 minutes because he traps how long she's gone to the grocery store, but she can start by stopping in and we can guide and give her some information and we can slow and she can come back. So walk-ins are available. So 24 seven, we are here to provide services. So if she's going for a walk, taking the dog for a walk, going to the grocery store, and she has time to stop in here to just talk with us. We're here to do it. They don't have to be saying, I'm leaving the situation. I want out right now. They need to just talk with somebody and learn and listen and hear them and be able to determine what's best for her situation right now of when she should make certain moves in her situation. Because we never want to jeopardize her well-being. Okay, so this this is great information. And again, I want to give the website out because you probably have information like this on the website as well. Yes. Yes, we definitely. Our website, again, lacasacenter.org. Okay. L-A-C-A-S-A-C-E-N-T-E-R, lacasacenter.org is a wonderful way. All our phone numbers are there, all the services that we provide um, and all the different avenues that you can reach us. So please reach out to that. So let's finish with, so this has been wonderful. We're at the top of the hour here and, and we're going to have to wrap, but let's finish with a, with a typical success story or, you know, a story that um, shows what can happen when someone is able to get the support that they need. 
Sure. Um, all right, for example, and tying into many of the things we do, we also have a wonderful resale store called La Casa oh, Collection. Yes. yes. And the, the La Casa Collection came to be as an avenue of respect and dignity for those that we serve. Instead of giving them handouts and say, because we get wonderful donations here, like many of our sister organizations, instead of handing them that, we developed a store and they can go shopping and shop with dignity like anyone else to get what they need and support. So we had a young woman who um, was here and was within our shelter. She was able, she, again, rebuilding her life, making a move. She ended up not having anything. She was, she came with only the clothes on her back. She needed to rebuild her life. So when she came into the shelter, again, we know they're in trauma, Katana. That's the key thing too, is trauma. We need to be trauma informed when we're working with individuals because trauma affects every individual a little differently. And it's the brain that responds to trauma and how people respond. So she was applying for a job, but she went to our store because all of our clients, anyone who comes for services here can shop at our store for free. And it's a very upscale, wonderful, more of a boutique um, store. So she went to the store and our staff assisted her and she received an entire suit, you know, blouse, belt, scarf, shoes. And, and a, when she went to the, uh, to the cashier to cash out, she was explaining that she was going on a job interview and she teared up and said, this is preparing me for my interview and I can't thank you enough. And, you know, being who I am, I had to find out, did she get the job? And yes, she did. She got her job. She was able to enter that interview with confidence when she went for the interview. So she went for the job. She got the interview. We also were able to assist in looking at getting an apartment for her so that she could transition into an apartment and give her a multiple of resources within the community that would support her too. Um, again, and if she's in need of food, food banks, um, and other resources that we have. Um, we also help them with um, transportation. And I think you even helped us at one point, we got a van for one of our clients and her family. So, you know, we take it as a challenge, you know. Yeah, my <laughs> husband went shopping and we found a donor to donate it. Yeah. To, to pay for it at the dealership. <laughs> and we got a van for a family who needed it so that she could work and get her children yes. um, to school and so on. So we were able to rebuild, uh, or she was able to rebuild her life and be successful and leave that domestic violence situation. Mm -hmm. and, and she also you know, had counseling and received individual counseling. And invariably, I hear from uh, individuals that will come to me and say, you have no idea, you saved my life, You've saved my children's life. And you know, I just have to one little short story that of you know, I, I can't I, even imagine having this much support. I had a book. <laughs> yes, <laughs> you know, a book. Yeah. And then I remember there was a manager who inspired me, you know, when I went out and got a job. But I mean, to hear this support. So go ahead with that. But I, I, I love that. That's so exciting to, there, to hear that someone can get that kind of support. There was a, a young mother who had children, three children, and she was in our shelter. Um, she did end up leaving the domestic violence situation. And again, we assisted her. But I was sitting in my office and my windows. I could see a car came up, literally held together with duct tape. And I saw her carrying bags out of her car. So I got up and, and went to the door and, you know, helped her. And I said, you know, can I help you? And she said, I want you to know everything that you've done for me here, that you have saved my life, saved my children's life. I am making it and I am happy and I want to give back and my children. So she said, I don't want you to worry about this because I'm a coupon queen. So I coupon crazy, but she brought in bags of brand new toys. And she said, I have to do this. I want to give back to other children that are in the shelter what you gave me means the world to me and I want to do this. And I'm coming back because I'm gonna bring things for the mothers too, because I'm a coupon clipper. And <laughs> I, I mean, how impressed 
for her to do that. Yeah. And she just really felt that that was, she needed to give back to help other women and children who were in the same situation she would have been in when she started yes. with us. So, um, and to me, that means the world when they come oh. back. Yes, absolutely. And I, and I'll share one story that when I, um, was teaching the class, um, I'll, I'll, you know, when I was teaching the class, one of the gals was in one of your places, but she didn't have a job. She didn't, you know, didn't have her own home. And, you know, and I, I came back a year later for a fundraiser and not only had, you know, had she like kind of graduated, she had bought a home. She not only had a job, but she had bought her own house for her family. And she was a spokesperson that for that event. Yes, I do remember oh that. God. I just, I cried. I was so excited because, um, and I remember this was another thing. I was um, facilitating Barbara Stanny's um, workshop, Secrets of Successful um, High Earner, no, um, something like that. It was, anyways, it was a course I was facilitating to your, or, to your gals. And so I'm just doing, you know, a program. And so I, I told them, I said, the problems you have, um, they're not out there. They're in here. And, and, I, and I said it because that was part of the program. And I went out to my car and I cried on the way home. <laughs> Thinking, yes. who are you to say that? You are so <laughs> lucky. And I just was beating myself up. And I said, you know, how could you do that? I come back the next week and they're going, one of the girls said, thank you so much for saying that because it's true. And she, then she told me what she did. And um, she, and it was something about, she was smoking and the cigarettes fell on the ground and, and she was at court and she realized that I am wasting all this money and I could be using this for my kids. She says, I quit smoking immediately. And she says, look at all the money I have. And she shows a big fan of money. <laughs> <laughs> this is what I've saved. She came, she showed us what she saved that, that um, week. And she said, I was able to give my kids money to go to the book, you know, to the book club or whatever and buy books. And she was just so empowered. And so it's, it's amazing that when these women are given good information and, and given support, it can just, you know, anyone, it, it transforms. It can, because it's just these beliefs we have are false. Yes. And, you know, they receive these beliefs that they're no good or not good enough. Exactly. And, and, and when you tell them it's all in your head, it's not true. You have the power inside of you. They believe it and then they can thrive. Exactly. Because they have been told over and over they're useless. They're no value. You're not going to make it. You can't live without me. There's so many messages that they've heard over and over and over. And yes, it's in their head and it replays, you know, constantly they're replaying that. So when they're able to, when you're able to empower them to develop the skills that they feel they need and want and can do, and that they do have that ability and there's people that believe them and that are behind them, are rooting for them, um, that can mean the world to them to yeah. succeed. And I know the case you're talking about, it was a very powerful where, a gun was involved and held to her head and the police showed up and there was um, severe, severe violence in that home. And to see where she was today, yes, she has her own <laughs> home and her children. And so it's, it, it's wonderful to see those. And that is what, you know, sometimes people say, how can you work in, that, in the field such as this? It is so very, very rewarding when, mm -hmm. again, you're able to assist someone in adding some stability in their life and having them thrive, having them yes, really yes, thrive. Right. And it, it's very exciting to see yeah. and be a part of. And invariably, yeah. everywhere I go, people will share a story. And it's a wonderful thing to, to hear. So, well, um, Bobette, I have been very honored to be able to help with your program and be part of it. And I, and I thank you so much for coming on the program today and, and just sharing your story and the program that you have and, and this wisdom um, for anyone who is listening, who may be affected by this or know someone that there is hope and that there is definitely the thriving and the rainbow. It is all possible if you just know how to get the support. So thank you very much.
Yes, and thank you, Katana. Again, your friendship is a treasure for us at La Casa and the women, and actually the staff that you worked with here. When she found out I was going to be interviewing with you, she just says, oh my gosh, I love Katana. She's such a <laughs> wonderful dynamic. And the impact that you had on that class, I just want you to know, um, has been very significant and very relevant. And you're always welcome back. And I'm sure we'll have a, another large crowd that would love to come <laughs> to your course. So yeah, that's so thank fact. you for being a good friend of ours. You're welcome. You're welcome. And and thank you. So I and I will circle back with you on that, I promise. Great. And well, women out there, reach out. There is help, there is assistance, and this is Women's History Month, and we are, we're making history. Yes. And thank you for drawing attention to the International Women's uh, Day and month, making it a whole month. And so thank you, Katana. Um, it's a very important issue. Absolutely. Thank you. So everyone, I am so thrilled that you've been here for this inspirational message on International Women's Day and International Women's Month. If you want to become part of our community so you can learn more about our guests, um, we have a monthly easing that goes out. The one that went out this month was celebrating International Women's Day and um, we had articles from both Bobette and from our other guests this month, Ann Doyle. And um, you'll also get access and we had um, a free event that was going on. So if you want to become part of the community and have access to our online school, the Smart Women's Academy, you can go to joinsmartwomen.com, joinsmartwomen.com, and you'll put your name and email and then you'll be part of our community. So um, don't forget if you're watching or um, to the show on Smart Women TV through YouTube, or if you are listening um, through one of our podcasts, please like us, share us with those that you love. And until our next meeting together, go out and live with more purpose, more passion and prosperity. Smart Women Talk is brought to you by Smart Women's Empowerment, a 501c3 nonprofit project of United Charitable. Music by Bill Lucas from his album, When It Rains. Available on Apple, Music, and Spotify. Catch us wherever you listen to your favorite podcast. And be sure to join our free community at joinsmartwomen.com to access all our free Smart Women resources.